You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Bed Rehabbers. Today, I chat to Kate Titus from Arizona in the United States. She owns and runs the practice A Loyal Companion. She's a certified fitness trainer and massage therapist, and she's also an author of two books, which she's written on the topic of canine mobility. So this is one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcasts, and I love these ones because we learn from vet rehabbers from all over the world how they practice vet rehab. So they share with us their challenges, their wins, their losses, in the hope that we can learn from their mistakes so we don't get to repeat the same things that they've done. They also share their tips and advice on how they navigate through this crazy world we live in today, and we get a glimpse into their vet rehab life. So I had a really great chat with Kate about her practice. She doesn't like using chlorine in her pool and I found our conversation about using a copper element system for her water management really interesting and I think that you guys are going to enjoy this one too. Over to Kate. Hey Kate, thank you so much for joining me. I am so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Kate, won't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got into the field of vet rehab? Sure. Um, First thing I I always want to point out is that I'm not a veterinarian and I'm not a veterinary technician. Um, I'm a mobility specialist and my entree into this niche that that I'm in now really came from my own um, hound dog, Harley, who's a Great Dane Foxhound St. Bernard guy. I wanted to spend more time with him. Um, I thought that would be through training, but it turns out I hated training. (laughs) So uh, I really came in through massage therapy. Um, and I was lucky enough to have a massage therapist um, instructor whose dog had had a failed TPLO, had, to, had pivot shift. And she took her class to her appointment with her um, holistic veterinarian. And that's how I found the folks at Orthopets. And uh, six months later, I was doing some rep work for them. And it's grown from there into a, a pool and a full facility and all mobility-based work. So it's been it's been a long road. It's been 10 years. 10 years. So is that how long you've had your practice open? 10 years? Uh, I have been I have been working in the field for 10 years. The facility that I'm in now has been open for six. So I was mobile okay. for the first four. Yeah. And you're also a canine fitness trainer, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. That was that was really um, that really kind of pushed me forward on on how I could apply that knowledge to my senior dogs and to the dogs that had mobility challenges. It really just kind of it clicked for me being able to see that. So let's chat a bit about um, about the facility where you where, what you've got now. So you basically yeah. um, you see dogs that come in, and you've got like a little bit of a canine gym, and you've got a, a pool. How did you mm-hmm. set it up from the beginning? Has it been something that you just sort of right in the beginning just established everything, or have you built it up slowly over time? Uh, so the facility is about thirty seven hundred square feet. The gym itself is about a thousand square feet, and the pool room is about a thousand square feet. Um, we opened the gym first, um, and nine months later opened the pool. So I knew we needed to get it open, get some revenue generated. So we did that first, and then took the next three or four months to open up uh, and build the pool. So that was all custom built on site uh, that was architects and and having to put sprinklers underneath the deck because they were more than five feet even though it's sitting beside 10,000 gallons of water you know Uh, so that was that was a process and it's the first facility brick and mortar that I've had so that was that was an interesting learning experience (laughs) so and do you own the building I do not. I rent the building. Um, it's in um, what we in the States would call a strip mall, and uh, it's a perfect location. I'm down the walkway from a PetSmart and across the uh, driveway from a Trader Joe's holistic okay, grocery well, store. So yeah. that exactly matches my demographic. So um, were you a little bit nervous about you know, putting a pool into a, into a facility that you didn't own? Is that something that you thought about? It is. Um, We had originally looked for um, spaces that were more in an industrial area, but that wasn't, uh, I didn't want 
my clientele, which is usually women over 45, 45 to 70, to have to come to a rough part of town just so that I could have a 20 foot ceiling. Um, I didn't worry too much about putting the pool in. Uh, the landlord knew what I was doing. He had no problem with it. So I said, okay, I've got 14 foot ceilings. Um, we're obviously very careful with what kind of materials go in the pool room. We don't want any slashes um, in the pool, but um, it's also a pretty heavy duty pool. So I'm not knock on wood too worried about that. <laughs> and um, what size is the pool? It's 14 by 22 okay. and it's four feet deep. So okay. I'm about five, seven. We couldn't go there's really no need to do the five feet and that's really for your really big, big dogs. And we just don't, we just don't have that many. It didn't justify yeah. having water up to my neck all the time to yeah. have a five foot deep pool. And um, how many, how many cases are you swimming at a time? Is it one dog at a time in the pool or do you yeah. have multiple swims? Um, always one dog at a time in the pool with one instructor. If it's a particularly difficult or large case, we may have two instructors in the water. Uh, with them just so that one can do some work and the other one can help keep them afloat and, yeah. and um, not panicked. We, we and, did before um, COVID. Oh, go ahead. No, no, carry on. Uh, I was just going to say that before COVID, we did do some recreational swim where we would okay. have four to five dogs at a time, but no instructor in the water. Yeah. I mean, with COVID, are you having to do curbside treatments now? Do they, are they dropping them off or are you allowing your clients into the facility? Um, I'm, allow I'm allowing clients in, but we've restricted where we'll be doing uh, the evaluation or the talking. We did, um, we still have eight by 12 foot rooms, but that's way too tight. So we now only have um, one client in the pool room and one client in the gym, which is 900 square feet. So I feel pretty comfortable about that. And then we have extra cleaning protocols and mask protocols. So I, I feel, I feel okay about doing that. Yeah, it's definitely a lot more of a challenge um, since yeah. COVID. <laughs> Yeah, and I see a lot of uh, a lot of clients who come in, and they just are like, "Thank you so much for letting me come in because I want to talk to people." People yeah. owners are craving communication right now, and it's it's just so hard. It's so hard to do that. I know for my my veterinary friends and colleagues that you know those rooms are small, and I wouldn't want to have a bunch of people in there either. Yeah. And, and so it's I think that's part of my role is to be able to say okay, this is what I'm hearing from your client about pain levels or not being able to follow protocols. And I can share that because I'm able to sit and look at them face to face and talk. So sometimes I get that information that they either don't have the opportunity or don't feel like they can tell their veterinarian. So that's part yeah. of the collaboration piece. I mean, we spend so much more time with our clients, right? And and I yeah. think that we, we have very different relationships. So for myself, obviously, um, being a vet and having been in private practice and then doing vet rehab. I can tell you that my relationships were completely different when mm -hmm. I was a vet rehabber. Um, and I think it's also because we are seeing um, those patients and those clients on a much more regular mm. basis, you know, like as a yeah. vet, you'll see them for an ear problem and then you check up them 10 to 14 days later, and then you might not see them for a long time. Whereas with us, we see them weekly, sometimes twice weekly. And so we really mm -hmm. get to know them and get to know about their families. And and also, right. I mean, I, I really also feel like my relationships with the with my patients were so much more solid as a vet rehab therapist mm -hmm. because you also get yeah. to to you know see their little personalities and their little quirks and mm -hmm. um, you know, seeing them so often. Um, do you find that too? Yeah, absolutely. That the trust building is just so important, especially when I'm going to put a dog in the water. Um, there are times when I, if I don't have a good, if we don't hit it off right away um, with the dog in, because I always do it a mobility evaluation. We do a consult first where we sit down and talk about, you know, what are your goals? Um, I've already got the medical records from the veterinarian, uh, from the referring veterinarian. So I've already looked through there. I know what their history is and understanding where they want to go and what's possible for their dog. So if the dog's a little shy, I usually want to set up a gym session where they come in and we do some confidence building exercises. So that dog knows they can trust me when I put a life jacket on them and carry them into the water, that, yeah. that I'm going to be there. And I yeah. think that has done, I think that's been a really one of the best things that I've done is making sure that I have that trust and that connection with the dog before we go toward the water. I mean, unlike a, um, 
an underwater treadmill where you walk them into the to the treadmill to the chamber you shut the door and the water starts to fill i have the added challenge of helping them walk down the ramp they can see what's coming so they have to know that i'm going to be there and i'm going to take care of them and i think the owners need to know that too because that energy going between those two um it will set the tone for how it's going to go yeah and um you obviously work together with the vets so the vets are referring mm -hmm. to you right correct yeah. yeah so they're referring to me um it uh, i'll be honest it makes me feel really good when i see notes come across and my name or my company name is in is in the records uh that tells me that one they know who i am and two they trust me to do good things with their clients and with, with their patients um so they send uh records across and then I'll see the dog for a mobility consultation and I'll send back a record that says, here's who I met with. This is what we talked about. This is what we identified as challenges and this is what we're gonna do going forward. And yeah. then depending on how um, involved the veterinarian wants to be in that collaboration, we'll continue to send updates. If they're just happy that they're here with us and say, take care of it, then that's all we need to do. So I try to make it as fluid a relationship as we can. Um, and that has worked out, that's worked out really well. And what are the type of recommendations that you're giving? So are you um, talking about like different food and are you talking about exercise? Um, you know, mm -hmm. the medications, obviously you leave for the veterinarian, but maybe you're suggesting yeah. supplements. So when you do that initial consult, like what are the main things that you're running through? So when I'm doing a consult, I'm really looking at the everyday management of the mobility challenge that the dog has. So I think I'm very, very light on nutritional information, primarily because I feel like that's crossing a line. So if I say, if I've got an overweight dog, I'll say, have you talked to your veterinarian about uh, mobility and metabolic food? Have you talked to them about how many calories your dog should be eating in a day? Have you asked these questions? So I'm really more there to, to help them know what they don't know to ask um, really more than anything else. And primarily uh, what I'm talking to them about is how do we get them through their everyday life? How do we make sure that, um, that they're able to go for those walks that they want to go through? Um, if the dog is in pain that I can see, you know, we talk about what are pain signals. Um, and they'll say, yeah, you know, we tried Remedil, but it just made him sick. And, you know, I'll say, well, there are other options. Talk to your veterinarian about what those other options are because they're not all made the same. So there are op other options. This isn't the end of the world if one doesn't work. So I'm really helping them with um, uh, asking the right questions. And the underlying part of, of the initial consult is really how well do they know their dog? What are they paying attention to? What are they seeing? Um, and how can I help them do that? better. Um, a lot of the dogs that I see have either urinary fecal incontinence or both, and that's a real challenge for a lot of owners. They've gone from having a completely house-trained dog that they could pop open the door, open the dog door, and they'll go out and do what they need to, to all of a sudden they're waking up with poop in the bed, or they've peed on their bed, or they've peed in the house. So I'm trying to help them come up with management strategies that go along with that. Um, and that, I think, that that's important. You know, I'm not coming at this from a medical standpoint. I'm coming from it from a management standpoint. So better equipment, how to help them know their own dog better, how to recognize those challenges and how to record them and share them with their vet team so that we can improve their dog's quality of life overall. Even a vet rehab person, you're, only, you're gonna see the dog once, maybe twice a week. Their um, uh, primary care veterinarian, maybe they'll see them every six months. The client to me is the key to the best quality of life for the dog. They see them every day, but they may not know what to look for. So I'm trying to educate them on what to look for, what to smell, what to feel, what to hear. Um, the classic one is, you know, the scraping of the toe uh, of, of a back foot coming through. You know, we've got, maybe there's some sciatic nerve issues going on and, and we're just not picking the leg up coming through. Um, there are things that, that I'll find on a dog that the owner will look at me and go, oh, I didn't realize that. And, you know, number four, number four digit nail on the back leg is down to the quick because they've been scraping the back leg. 
So I'm trying to help to open up their horizons for how they can help their veterinary team take better care of their dog. It's not important that they know why something is happening. It's important that they recognize that something is and bring it to the attention of their, of their vet team. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, you had come from a massage um, background. So did you do mm -hmm. massage therapy? So are you, are you doing any manual therapy on these patients? Or is, or is it more um, sort of hydrotherapy exercise and basically managing? And I, I love that what you said, you know, you're like, you, you're teaching them to ask the questions that they don't know to ask, you mm -hmm. know, because that's right. exactly it. Um, mm -hmm. If they have no idea, they're not going to ask them. So right. the idea of actually giving them the questions that they should be asking the vet um, is wonderful. Yeah, so um, I do massage on uh, quite a few of my patients. Um, and that has been really helpful, especially for the, the, the senior dogs. Um, these guys aren't moving around nearly as much as they should be. Um, I'll do massage if a dog doesn't like the water. Um, massage is my second line of defense to be able to, you know, keep the lymph moving, make sure we get the muscle stretched out so those joints are moving through as full a range of motion as possible. Um, and and the, I think massage being kind of the start of my uh, entree into this has been really helpful. I think I can listen more effectively with my hands. I can put my hands on a dog and say, okay, well, there, we're, we're missing muscle mass over here. This, this is not right. Um, I had a case a few weeks ago, well, probably two months ago now, um, where I'm doing massage on a dog and I get down to the uh, popliteal um, uh, lymph nodes and they're huge. And I said, have you talked to your veterinarian about this? And she said, no, I didn't even notice that. She got in to see her the next day, turned out the dog has lymphoma. It's been on, um, but we caught it early and uh, she's been on, uh, on chemo. She's gone through one round of chemo, and as a 16-year-old dog, she's gone through it well. Um, so it's things like that where I can, I can touch a dog and say, oh, this doesn't seem right. I have no idea what this is, but I know it shouldn't feel like that, and be able to help them understand what questions they need to ask. Yeah. So, I mean, it's great that you work together with the vets. Um, so, like, ex exactly like this, because it's really important for vets to know that whoever is treating their patients, so even who they're working with, is working mm -hmm. together with them um, exactly yeah. like that. You find something and you yeah. send them straight back. Um, yeah. So that's really awesome. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't, um, I feel like I have a, a wealth of information that comes not only from the owner, but from being around the dog and watching them move. I mean, one of the, we just had a, had a case last week actually, where we had a dog come in who um, had slipped uh, he'd had a bath and he slipped on the on the tile floor and he started roaching and was walking in a really protective way and they wanted to do some massage and I said I, w I, I will I want to feel what's happening but you know he's really tender in his in his lumbar spine um, and I took some video because he's a little terrier who bounces everywhere but I was able to take some video in my facility um, you know cranial caudal uh, medial lateral and uh, turns out this dog had two bulging discs um, in the lumbar spine ended up having a hemilaminectomy and it didn't go very well and they needed to know before they did the MRI if they needed to do the whole spine or just that area because he had some limping on the forelimb that was what he had come to see me for so I had the video that I had taken was able to send it to the neurologist and have her take one look at it and say yeah no we don't have any neurodeficiencies up front we can stay focused on what we've got post-surgery so yeah. I feel like I have the opportunity even just down to the floors we have elephant bark here and dogs walk very easily on my floors that doesn't happen in in a regular vet's office they're mostly you know super high sheen tile or that is easily cleaned. I mean, it has to be that way, but that's not a great way to see how a dog moves. You know, I've got yeah. 30 feet long runs that I can let a dog walk through the frame, take that video or take that photo that is going to be much more helpful for you. In addition, you can slow it down. You can look, you know, you can zoom it in, whatever that you can't do with a dog who was a complete spaz like Jasper was um, in his walking. So I really want to focus on providing as much support as I can to my veterinary colleagues. 
because yeah. I can, I have access to things that they don't. And it's usually because of time and space. So if yeah. I can do that, the dog and the client win. And that's, yeah. that's my goal. Yeah. So let's just chat um, how you get to your clients. So are most of your clients actually coming from veterinary referrals? I would say 75% are. We have a lot okay. of word of mouth. Um, I don't do I don't do anything that isn't completely targeted. So like my big expenses may be going to some of the dog festivals that we have here in Tucson. Yeah. Um, I don't do a lot of advertising in dog magazines or, or dog newspapers that we have here. I just don't do that because yeah. it's not it's not who I need to see. Who I need to see are the ones that are compromised, basically. That's who I'm here for. Not yeah. for Muffy who needs to learn how to swim. So 75% from vets, and then would you say the other 25% is from word of mouth and maybe some advertising or social media? Are you quite active on social media? Yeah, we have um, uh, Facebook and Instagram that we're most active on. Um, it's mostly word of mouth. Uh, I've yeah. built all of this primarily on, on word of mouth, and it's been nice word of mouth between veterinarians as well, which which makes me feel really good. That means that one professional has trusted me enough to recommend me to another professional. And that, that means a lot to me and those are sacred relationships. So um, I want to, uh, to support those and, and, uh, and, and, and do the best I can for anyone that sends me a, sends me a client. Uh, but I get yeah. a lot of clients who will walk in and say, oh yeah, we saw you know Jojo up the block who had um, an orthotic or had a brace or is in a wheelchair. Um, and I told my sister about it and now she's going to call you, you know? So it's that kind of when people find out that we're here and what we can do to help, yeah. they, they want to seek that out. Yeah. I mean, that's really great. I mean, the fact that 75% vet referrals, and like you said, you mentioned mm -hmm. people are vets are actually in their notes mentioning you by name or your practice mm -hmm. by name. I mean, that is really a good place to be because you're obviously getting that constant referrals and then you're obviously doing something right that you're getting all that word of mouth too. So yeah. um, well yeah. done. That's really great. Thank you. Um, I want to chat, uh, go back to the pool a little bit. Um, yeah. Is there anything you would have done differently having um, built the pool? So like anything you would have changed So maybe something you thought oh, maybe that wasn't the best idea. Um, well, I wouldn't, well, yeah, I think, um, I would have, everybody would like something to be a little bit bigger. Um, it's the biggest pool I could fit in the space that I had. I did a lot of renovation in the facility, so I could have moved a wall if I wanted to make that space bigger. Um, now that we're doing primarily, um, well, we're doing strictly mobility, I could have made the gym smaller and made the pool area a little bit bigger. Um, but I, I think uh, it, like when we first installed the sand filter, so I have a copper pool system. So we don't use chlorine and we don't use salt. It's great on the dog's coats. Um, the coats are really, really soft. The, the only drawback is some of the white dogs that swim with us either weekly or bi-weekly, um, they'll start to get a little green tinge in their coat from the copper because it's reacting. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, uh, when we first put the sand filter in and we put the connections and all the water coming in, we didn't think about the fact that we had to change the sand. So when we went to change the sand the first time, we're like, we can't get the top off because it's all glued in. So we had to come out and they had to come out and put connectors in. So now we have connection points at everywhere. There's something that's going to have to come out that we didn't have before. So like when we have to change the coppers in the cylinder that has now connectors that we can just lift it out and take care of it. So I definitely would have changed that. Um, and, uh, but, but otherwise, um, I wish I could find a solution for, we have a splash guard. So our splash guard is um, kind of like shower curtain material, which I can't think of what that's called right now. Um, but our water is so hard here in Tucson that it just, um, it sheets it and because it's seven feet tall there's no way for us to reach it to clean the top of it so we just have to change it every four or five months so I wish I could find something different to do with that we couldn't do plexiglass we couldn't do there's a lot of things that we couldn't do so we've kind of figured it out as we've gone along 
Um, but as far as changing anything else, I, I, I think we did a pretty good job. We custom built the ramp. There are no steps anywhere in the, in the facility. So we have, um, it's about a 40 degree um, ramp though, to get in and to get, to get up to the deck and then into the water. Uh, so that, that, that gets tiring after a while. Um, but, uh, but I think it's, I think it does what it needs to do in the space we have. It is not nearly ADA. We didn't have to make it ADA. If we did, we would have had to lap around the room a couple of times to get up to the deck. Mm -hmm. So we're lucky on that. We're lucky in that regard. Yeah, that's a good workout, even though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to chat to you about the copper electrodes. So like we, we've had a few, I've had a few podcasts before. Mm -hmm. We've actually talked about water quality. Um, mm -hmm. And um, people have actually spoken about it, but we've never had anyone that actually uses it. So did you do mm -hmm. that right from the beginning or yes. were you, okay, yeah. Yes. And um, are you doing water testing? So are you doing water testing with your water? We are checking, we're checking um, balance on, um, on chemicals as far okay. as being able to send it out uh, yeah. for water evaluation. That's not something that we do. We okay. don't do that very often. Yeah. Um, primarily because I know the water is going through the chamber every eight hours. So yeah. that the entire level of the pool can go through. I think it's it's a little it's a little different and and than it is say in an underwater treadmill, um, and we're also not putting um, post surgical cases in there. Okay. Um, we don't allow any open wounds in there at all. Yeah. Um, if they if the sutures have been out for two weeks and we still see any discharge or uh, there's even still scabbing on that, we're going to wait. So we're pretty careful about what what goes in as far as, as wounds and skin issues. And how does it work? Do you have to replace that the copper electrode every few years, or um, depends on how much you have to use it. So you have um, it's in a chamber. Um, yeah. It kind of looks like that thing where you go to the bank and they send that little tube that comes out and you put your yeah. checks in there. Anyway, so it looks like that. And there's a copper plate and a titanium plate. The copper plate is the one that wears out the most. And I think we're on about, I want to say six months that we're able yeah. to use that. Um, and, uh, and you'll, you know, you just take it off, take the electrode off, replace the plate, put it in, put it back together. Yeah. Um, our big key that we know the copper is getting low is that it'll start to leak ever so slightly where the screw holes are that goes in for the electrodes. So um, it's really easy. It's really easy to work with the, the um, copper pieces are not that expensive. If I look at the cost of chlorine or bromide, uh, I yeah. think it's actually less expensive and it's certainly less messy. Um, and if I'm going to stand in water for three hours at a time, I prefer it not be chlorine. Or yeah. um, I mean, was that the reason that you decided to do it? I mean, was it an expense thing or was it just for, for your own, exp your own experience being in the water? Um, when I knew there was an option, um, it was both. One, I didn't want dogs to have to be um, rinsed off after they came out, which they don't have to be. And I didn't want to stand chemicals. Yeah. Um, I worked pretty closely with uh, Lori at CRCG in Denver. Um, on creating that particular space and not having to figure all of that out myself. That was probably one of the best investments that I made. Um, and, um, you know, she was uh, very helpful in getting the copper piece set up. I didn't want to do chlorine. I don't like the way chlorine smells. And, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a really good selling point for us because when when we tell an owner that, hey, you know, we don't want your dog to be exposed to this for whatever reason, um, and here's why, and we don't want to stand in it, then they understand that. I know exactly why you have to do it um, in underwater treadmills. I totally get that. I just choose not to do it in my pool and what we're using yeah. it for. So. Do you ever have any problems with algae? None. None, no, yeah. I never had an algae problem at all. So I've heard about some people using like a UV light together with the, the copper and um, sort of that mm -hmm. combination. Um, but it's interesting. So you're just using the copper with no problems. 
I use the copper and then we do, um, if we need to, um, we need to fortify it, we'll use fresh and clear, um, uh, which is a quick, which is a, a quick cleaner. And then on Sundays, we're closed on Monday. So Sunday afternoon, uh, we do a chlorine shock every week. Okay. So we shock it. And then uh, by the time the dogs are back in the water, the chlorine rate is less than one part per million. Okay. So normal in a pool is four to five. So it's yeah. down well below one. Okay. So we get the cleaning benefits, but not the, the harsh benefits. And it's on the day when it's closed. So like you exactly. say, it's the levels are down before the animals are there and the people are in. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, let's move over onto the gym quickly. So what are the kind of facilities that you have in the gym? So we have uh, a lot of uh, fit pause equipment, um, a lot of, um, uh, there's a newer one on the market that, that we've been working that name ex uh, escapes me right now, but we do a lot of inflatables, uh, wobble boards, Cavaletti, um, canine climbs. Uh, we use those a lot to teach dogs how to use a ramp. Um, so we really, I really try to use the gym area as a way to practice things that they do in their ADLs. So we're talking about things like functional mobility, being able to squat to pee and poop or lift a leg to pee, um, grooming, standing to and getting to eating and drinking and mental engagement. So we're looking at using that kind of those kind of equipment, a lot of, you know, weaving and weaving with the Cavalettis. So um, learning to back up, uh, again, get back up and get out of the kitchen um, or, you know, get out of the, the, the living room. Um, but the, uh, the gym is really a place to, for them, for them to practice. Um, and uh, that's been, it's been really effective, especially teaching dogs how to use uh, steps or ramps for in the house or in the car, because we can set, uh, we've built our own platforms. So we put four, four or six of those together, and then we can raise the height to the level of the, uh, the tailgate of the truck or the SUV or the car, and the owners can practice helping their dogs up the ramp. I think that one of the biggest mistakes folks do is try to teach a dog how to use a ramp in the middle of the parking lot. Um, and it's, you know, super steep ramp and, and, the dog, and they don't have a harness on them and they wonder why the dog won't walk up the ramp. <laughs> it's like, well, I, I don't think I would do that either. So, um, so yeah, we try to, we try to use that as a, as a place to practice those everyday activities. Great. So for those of you that don't know, ADLs are activities of daily living, daily. right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, I wanted to, to chat to you about the, the gym. So do you, do you, are you only using it or do you like the clients come in, are, are they able to use it too? So, I mean, I remember, um, actually going, um, to see orthopeds, um, in Denver mm -hmm. and I stayed with them for a while and, and they took me around to see like it was this massive gym there, it was like a dog gym. And I remember just being completely blown away. This was like 2009, 2010 kind of time. And there was just this massive, massive dog gym, you know, where uh, owners would come. There were therapists in that there too, um, but owners would take their dogs and they would swim them and do the gym. Uh, is it something like that, or was it mainly for for you and your therapist to be able to to do the exercises? It was pre-COVID. <laughs> Uh, folks could come in. Now we uh, we used to have open gym memberships where folks could come in, use yeah. our equipment, and they'd have a monthly membership. Um, now we're letting people come in one by one if they want to use the gym without uh, without someone there to uh, to support them. Um, yeah. So yeah, we do that. It's just much less now that COVID's hit. So it must have been quite a good source of income because it's obviously a recurring income on a monthly on a monthly basis. Yes. Yeah, that and our open swim um, income was a nice passive revenue stream because we yeah. the, all these dogs could swim, they got along together, and they could handle the ramp. So yes. it was really just use of the of the facility in the pool that the people were paying for. Um, yeah. So that was that was a nice a nice bit of revenue that we've had to put on hold and offer in a different way. And now that's actually not it's actually drawing some revenue from me right now yeah. um, we have about uh, 10 or 15 consistent open swimmers that we're still honoring the membership but we've changed the way they can take advantage of it so they're no longer all swimming together 
Um, yeah. They swim separately for 30 minutes rather than all together for an hour. So, yeah. so that puts some strain on the availability of the pool. It's a, uh, it's not a good long-term solution, but uh, I feel like I owe it to those, that crew that has been with me for almost five years to do the right thing. Um, and my plan is probably after the first of the year to send out an email and have a Zoom call and say, okay, look, here's, here's the reality, the financial reality of what's happening. Quite frankly, yeah. I'm losing my shirt, continuing to do what we're doing. So let's come up with another way to do this. It may be limiting the number of times you can come. Uh, it can be a lot of different things, but let's brainstorm it. So making them part of the solution, I think, is going to be helpful there. Yeah. Um, I, I do I do a lot in the community, and I want to make sure that I'm taking care of, of the folks that have taken care of me. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. You, you're going to have to do that. Um, you're taking away from time where you could be treating other patients, too. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so when you did it, so just taking a step back, when you, when you, pre-COVID times, how did you set it up? So did you have certain days and times where you had it open, where you, where you weren't seeing patients? Um, was it certain days or afternoons a week? How did it actually all fit together? So we set up open swim times. So we're talking about the pool at this point. So we yeah. set up open swim times where... Um, and it was, there was at least, at least one or two every day. And some days there were three, um, open swim times. And that was usually an hour to two hours at a time, um, where multiple dogs could come in and swim during those times that would give my assistant and I a break, uh, where we could see clients in the gym or I could do massage, um, or she could do other, uh, do other things that she was in charge of, um, and that, that worked out pretty well. And we've actually been able to pretty much keep those same times um, now um, where we say, okay, this is when open swimmers can come in and swim. But the challenge is, is that we have a little bit of a leak from that because we have uh, more open swimmers than we have half hour blocks every day. So we've been doing some you know, playing Jenga a little bit to get everybody in. Uh, but yeah, that worked out, that worked out really, really well. So we always knew that, you know, from nine to 10, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday morning, that was always an open swim time. Yeah. So, so then you, own, sorry, yeah, so then the you, times. those are the times you open. Yeah. Open yeah. Swims. yeah. Yeah. And we use a, a, um, a CRM, a, a customer management uh, software called MindBody. Uh, which does a lot, works with a lot of yoga studios, a lot of gyms. So it, it pretty much fit our model uh, of what was going to be helpful. Folks used to be able to select their time online. I've had to take all of the scheduling availability for clients out of the online piece because we need to keep as much control of the schedule as we can right now to make sure that uh, I'm not getting in the pool three and four times a day. I have a block here and a block here. And sometimes it's a four hour block and nothing else. Um, or sometimes it's a two hour and a three hour, but I have out of pool activities between there. So massages, mobility consults, uh, wheelchair fittings, things like that. Um, so we, we've learned over the years how to control our own schedule and make, mm. make sure that it's not just on a whim that, oh, I'd love to come in at 10 and, and 10 and do this. It's like, well, yeah. that doesn't work with what we need to do. So. So those um, swim times where you had the open times, you had a, f a maximum amount of, of clients that could come and they needed to go online and book that. So they would right. go check to see, oh, is there a space? And if, if it was all booked up, then they couldn't go. So you had six or whatever it was, which you, was your maximum. And then nobody else would, they knew that they couldn't come unless they'd actually booked that time. That's correct. Yeah. And then we, okay. do, we also do, because we, you, you get into a rotation of regulars and we also know that while most of the dogs get along and they do pretty well with other dogs, you do have combinations that don't work. So we would take the time to say, you know what, Spencer is coming today. So Ruby, you might want to come in the two hour, the two o'clock slot rather than the one. I know that he makes it difficult for Ruby to get in the water. So we kind of try to manage that. Um, and I think clients appreciate that heads up when, when we see that. 
Awesome. So, I mean, it sounds like you're hectically busy, like with everything. So how many, how many days a week are you open? We are open six days a week. Um, Sunday, we work a half day, nine to, um, nine to one, but we're closed on Mondays. Yeah. And we'll work, uh, we'll work nine to five thirty. with the amount of clients that we've had. I take a lot of eight o'clocks, but I try to keep my 8 a.m. for a emergency spot or someone that, that really needs it. Uh, but they end up getting filled almost every week. So Sunday afternoon and Monday, when you're not cleaning the pool and shocking it, you're writing books because you've also written two books. Yeah. And I believe that one has just come out. Um, your yes. second one. Yeah. Tell us yes. about your books. I'd love to okay. hear. Thank you. So the first one is called Sit, Stand, Go. That came out in January of 2019. Um, and that's really uh, does a couple of things. Number one, it teaches people how to pay attention. That is the underlying purpose of that book. What are you looking for? Uh, the second uh, portion of that book teaches um, the owner to do um, a DIY mobility evaluation of their own dog. So a do it yourself, what to look for, how to take videos and photographs, what's important, and then how to put all that together and bring it to your veterinarian. So they see what you are seeing at home. And then the last half of that book is all about experiencing your dog's world the way they do. So looking at, um, looking at the, uh, uh, the indoor space, the outdoor space, um, figuring out what's causing uh, any challenges for them. So one of the one of the big ones is there's too much clutter around a door that you use a lot to get a dog in a wheelchair in the door. Um, how do you look at that space and say, oh, okay, I see why he hesitates to go in there every time. Looking at dog doors, looking at their outdoor space, are there dangerous steps out there? Can you reroute? help him understand that this is the better way to go? Or do you use the path that he's already created? Um, they have a path that they like to follow. So how do we make that path easier for them to access and have less dangers around the way? And the same thing with travel, getting them in and out of the car, how to travel safely with them, how to make sure they're safe while they're in the car. Um, I think travel is a really important and overlooked piece because if you don't take your dog places or don't get them out of the house or the apartment, um, their world gets really small and shrinking world syndrome sets in pretty quickly. Uh, so it's important to me that folks know how to do that and don't think of it as a chore, but think of it as something that they can overcome and they can get them in the car. So that's it, stand, go. And then emotion to motion. Um, it, that one is all about the role of the mind in your dog's mobility. So talking about um, the seven basic emotions that all mammals have. Um, we're talking about uh, seeking, you know, that that energetic anticipation, that things that that makes them explore their world. That's a, that's a huge one. Fear, anger, um, sadness or loneliness. Uh, that's uh, being left behind or being left in another room while the rest of the family is in another place. Um, social joy, so play, uh, and then care and lust are the other are the other seven. We all have those. They're all centers in the brain. So helping folks understand that you know emotions are actually physiological events. You know, it's it's heart racing. It's pupils dilating, and then there's a feeling associated with that. Um, and how that impacts how their, their dog moves and their movement choices. So if you have the dog's water bowl on the opposite side of the kitchen um, and your dog has some rear end weakness or some balance issues, the thought of walking across that slippery floor to get a drink of water, they may not, have a, they may not get as much water intake because there's a fear level there. Um, mm -hmm. They may have fallen, they may have done a Bambi on that floor, uh, and they have a long memory for that. So their movement decisions are really based in emotion. Yeah. And you can use that knowledge um, to be able to improve their quality of life. So to really activate that seeking emotion with, uh, with mental enrichment games and figuring out what kind of game your dog really likes. You know, your dog may not be food motivated, so we got to think of something else. Maybe they like to play tug. Uh, there's one story I tell in the book about a dog named Kit, who was a border collie, who was probably 14 at the time, and she decided she was not going for a walk. 
and her mom knew about Trinking World and she knew she had to get her outside. And I asked her, you know, what's, what's Kit's favorite game? I mean, she's Border Collie. She wants to do something. Uh, she said tug. And I said, okay, we need to start moving the tug game around. So we need to, if she was in the bedroom, we need to go play tug in the living room. And then we need to go play tug right outside the front door. And then you need to carry the tug toy as you walk out to get the mail. And then you need to take it with you and a quarter of a mile down the way you stop and you play tug. So being able to, to understand what drives that seeking and that, that desire to, um, to explore their world, that can help you understand why they move how they do or why they don't. And it explains hesitation at, at not wanting to move to go up the ramp like we talked about before. Um, it's not just stubbornness. That's not what that is. It's not just, I'm not going to do that. There is an actual emotion and a thought process that's going on behind that. And the more you understand it, uh, the better able you are to help your dog move through it and get the activity that you know is going to benefit them because yeah. you know they love to ride in the car but you know, it scares the bejesus out of them to try to walk up the ramp or they don't feel like they can jump into the car. They don't want you to pick them up a particular way. So knowing that there's something behind that, that it really is, that there's a whole nother level. And I really feel like the mind is just such an underappreciated part of canine mobility. We just think totally about, uh, about the physiological elements of it. Yes, we've got weakness in the rear limb, or we've got an IBDD dog or a DM dog. Whatever it happens to be, there's still a mental element and an emotional element behind every one of those decisions that they make. And that's that's what this book is about. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like both of the books are just really great for creating awareness in pet owners, just to be aware exactly. of everything. Be aware of mm -hmm. the emotions, be aware of the, the environments um and you know how how once they have that awareness then what they can do about it so also giving exactly. them solutions you know, be aware yes. and then actually here are some solutions so they can start actually mm -hmm. thinking start thinking more about it sounded yeah. really interesting uh, for the listeners out there if you guys are interested in these books and i'm sure these are ones that you're going to want to share um with your clients um we'll put the urls in the description notes Kate, thank, thank you, you so much. It's been so wonderful chatting to you. Um, before we say goodbye, is there anything that you would like to share with all the vet we have therapists around the world? So any advice that you could give them, especially for those people that are just starting off in, in their career? Um, you know, I think one of the most important skills that I've developed over the last 10 years is how to listen, not only to my clients, but to the dogs and to your colleagues. I think um, there's a whole lot of information floating around there if you just take the time to hear it and take it in and be able to apply it. I think that is that is huge. You know, it's it, the same way I want pet owners to pay attention. I think it would behoove everyone in the veterinary community to pay attention to what they're seeing and what they're hearing and what they're smelling and what they're feeling. Just pay attention, yeah. pay yeah. attention. Love it. Okay. Kate, thank you for your time. It's been awesome chatting to you. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. Cheers. All righty. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review and know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers. So if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.